talked about a foundation. He is that, isn't he? Amen. So it, does it go along with humility? Absolutely. It goes along with humility. Because to know who we are, we have to know who he is. And we need to know what undergirds us and supports us. Good morning. My name is Pastor Chris. If you are, are new today, uh, welcome. We are beginning a very short series because we lost last week. And so I, uh, this is what you were going to hear last week. And next week you're going to hear two weeks combined. So I uh, plan to be here a couple hours. And uh, no, 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 no. But it is called Who Am I? Who Am I? Who Am I? No, I didn't come up with this after I bumped my head. We're kind of to look at who are we? Who are we? Where do you find your worth? Often we get absorbed in this world and, and our life. We get filled with ourselves. We begin to believe the image we portray on social media. We lose perspective of who we really are. And the truth is, we are nothing compared to Almighty God. So I'd like to talk to you this morning about uh, Chris's theory of all things being relative. Chris's theory, that's not to be confused with Einstein's theory of relativity. I can't help it. We had a comedian last night, so I'm just trying to up my game a little bit. No, but really, the theory of things all being relative, things are viewed differently depending on what you compare them to. Our perception changes how we see things. Let's give me, let me give you some examples. You're in a car accident, and the car is totaled. And you're looking at that car, and immediately you start to say, what am I going to do? I have to replace the car. Look at the damage. I wonder how much I'm going to get for a replacement vehicle. And then you stop. And we, you, you stop looking at the damage in the car, and you start to realize no one was injured. And so the viewpoint of that accident then changes on how you look at it, the negative or the positive of it. That same accident can be seen two different ways. We're going to get snowfall. A lot of snow comes, and one person can look at that, especially the early morning commuter who's heading to work. Boy, that's a real nuisance. I might have to call out from work. It's going to take me hours to get there. There's all those drivers who don't know how to drive in the snow. But to the snowboarder and the skier, this is a great day. It's all how you look at it. How about the rain? Sometimes that ruins some people's day. Maybe they wanted to go out and be outside, and the rain kind of ruined that. But to the farmer, rain's an amazing thing. We need rain, right? It's how you look at it and what you compare it to. If you make a lot of money, if you make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year and you get a $500 bonus, which doesn't even equal one week's pay, $500 doesn't seem like that much. But if you only make a few hundred dollars a week, a $500 bonus is pretty good. That's a whole extra week's pay. So how you look at things depends on how how we perceive things changes how we look at them. You know, uh, Proverbs 27, 7 says it this way. One who is full loathes honey. He hates honey. But to the one who is hungry, everything bitter is sweet. So there's your concept right there. When you're full, even the sweetest thing doesn't seem good. But if you're hungry, you'll take anything. To the one who has everything and anything they want, even the best things can seem insignificant and tasteless. But the one who works hard and has little, they value all they have, even the things that the other person dislikes. Well, what about us personally? Where do we find our personal value? Is it in our possessions? Is it in our, in our status? Is it in our intelligence, our abilities, our wealth? etc. What, what is it for you? Do you try and put on an image for others to see that really isn't you? We can clearly see, if you're on Facebook and you see people's posts, that m most people are trying to set up and show the quintessential perfect life. 
says, my life looks pretty good. They put on the best pictures and they talk about the best times that are going on, but really their life is actually nothing like they portray it. And we do this too as Christians uh, when we evaluate our life and our level of sin and we compare ourselves to someone else, well, I'm not so bad, I'm not as bad as he is. I don't do the sin that he does. We compare our sin with those with much, much worse sin and feel better about ourselves. We, we, we make ourselves feel good. But compared to Jesus' perfection, we're all unjustified. Jesus tells a parable about this in Luke 18, 9 to 14. Follow along on the screen. And then Jesus told the story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters and sinners and adulterers. I'm certainly not like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. The tax collector stood at a distance and he dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow and sang, oh God, be merciful to me for I, I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, Jesus is speaking again now, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So the only one we should be comparing ourselves to is Jesus, who in turn is the same as God the Father. So when we compare who we are to who he is, there is no comparison. David says in Psalm 8, verse 4, What is man that you are mindful of him? What are we that God would have spend any time on us at all? Who are we? What are we? We think so much about ourselves, but compared to him, we are but nothing. So I would like to uh, look at right now in this, these two weeks, who am I as compared to the great I am? Now, what do I mean by that? Well, maybe you're not a person who's in the Bible or new to Christianity or don't know anything about it. What, who is the great I am? Well, that's what God called himself. He met Moses, and Moses said, who should I tell them sent me when he goes back to Egypt to get the Israelites out? And God says, tell them the I am sent you. I am means I am, I always was, I am now, I will always be, I am. So who am I compared to the great I am? The only answer can be humbled by who he is and how insignificant I am compared to him. So we're in Philippians 2. You probably saw that on your note plate. Please follow along in the notes and make notes there. I did put some extra notes in there for you to follow along with, and they're pulled right out of the verses that we're going on. So we're going to be in, in verse 1 of chapter 2, and let's read along 1 through 11 this morning. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. Verse 5. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his design, divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So again, the series is who am I? Who am I? The, 
the, over the next couple messages, we're going to look at who we are compared to the owner and creator of the universe. And then how we as his children should see ourselves relative to others. Remember, everything is relative to what you compare it to. So as we read in Philippians, humility is the bottom line in our comparison to the Father. The definition of humility in the dictionary would be a modest or low view of one's own importance. A modest or low view of one's own importance. That's really focused inwardly. If you look at the biblical definition of humility, it says it seeks to bring glory and honor to God and looks out for the interests of others, God and others. So that's outwardly focused. If we're looking at humility from a biblical definition. So how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as important? How do you see yourself as compared to God? How do you see yourself as compared to others? Well, Paul addresses this in our passage, and he opens his letter encouraging the church to stand firm against the pressures coming from outside the church. And in verse 30 of chapter 1, he says, We are in this struggle together. You have seen my struggle in the past, and you know that I am still in the midst of it. He's in prison. He's hoping to get out. He's writing to the Philippians, desperately wanting to go visit them. He realized that the Philippians, as well as us, need to be united, not only against our common foes, but also we need to be united in heart and mind and in mutual regard for one another. So as we begin, therefore, in chapter 2, he addresses the basis for humility. He lays it out. What is the basis for humility? He addresses this within the unified relationship we all should have together and what we have together with Jesus. That's what ties us together. That's what we have in common. It highlights our union with Christ and our responsibility accordingly. So if we look at verse 1 again, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Those four things should be the thing, the glue that ties us, his followers, disciples of his, ties us together. That's what tied the Philippian, what he said should tie the Philippian church together. So let's break them down. The first thing he says, encouragement and belonging. This encouragement is from the Greek word that means to come alongside and help, counsel, or exhort. And exhort means to urge or to advise earnestly. Do we have that encouragement among ourselves? This is what Jesus does for his own. He does this for us. He helps us, counsels us, he exhorts us to urge us and to advise us through his Holy Spirit. Do we do that for one another? Paul's reminding them that their experience of salvation when the Holy Spirit came alongside of them and comforted them and strengthened them. That's what God did. So is there an encouragement in your belonging together? Second, he talked about being comforted by his love. Are we comforted by his love. The Greek word there, comfort, is translated, it portrays the Lord coming close and whispering in your ear a gentle blessing or a tender counsel. Doing that in the believer's ear. Paul reminds them Christ who gave his life for them loved them unconditionally. Do you feel loved unconditionally by Christ? You should. He does. This comfort and encouragement of love should prompt us as his followers to join hands in common action, in unity, and we should refrain from divisiveness. And maybe we're not in a problem right now, but when we get there, we should... I can't think of the word I want. We should naturally come to this unity understanding that we have love in him. Default is the word I want. Of course, it always comes 10 minutes, 10 seconds later. 
as we realize his comfort, do we default to that, even in times of disagreement? That's what we should do. So even if we're not in that right now, we should be prepared for it, and that's going to come from unity. The third thing is fellowship of the Spirit, he says. There was a lot in this verse. Our common partnership of eternal life provided by the Holy Spirit that's inside of us. This should promote that exercise of unity. We have been made by one Spirit and are partners with him and with each other. That Spirit, that Holy Spirit that indwells each of us ties us all together. So to have unity and to see things, it is all based in, in Christ and in his Holy Spirit. And the last thing he speaks about there, do you have tender and compassionate hearts? God's deep affection and compassion for every believer should result in unity. And this compassion and mercy that came from him to us at salvation and now passes through us, we should give to others. We should give to others. And if we have tenderness and compassion, then unity should be a normal and expected result. Our unity as his followers call us to have humility with each other and should be the foundation of that humility. So as we look at ourselves compared to God and then we look around and see each other, we realize that we are all one unified body, part of the body of Christ. That should lead us to have hope and joy that comes from being one with each other and with him. You should realize that this is a family not your blood family, but it is your blood family in connected with Jesus' blood. Romans thir uh, 15, verse 13 says, I pray that God, the source of all hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. And, when, and then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. This should fill us with hope of what happens as we stay together as a family and we are connected to Christ because he rose from the dead and the promises that we, we have in him, we should have great joy and it should fill us. A commentary said this when I was reading along. I thought it was good. Hope does not operate apart from trust. In fact, it is the forward-looking aspect of faith. You have, if you have faith, you're naturally going to have hope. Paul expects a rich, abounding experience of hope along with an overflowing of love. 1 Peter 1.8 says this, You love him even though you have never seen him. And though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. Do you have a joy in the unity of this body, in this family of Echo Valley Grace Church, which is part of the bigger body of Christ in Pine Grove? Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania, the bigger body of Christ of Christ made up of Christians around the world. Our faith should produce love and joy, and this joy is based in the expectation of our future with Christ. So if the basis of our humility is in our unity, then what is the evidence of humility? Point two, what is the evidence of humility? Let's read verse 2. And then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. So number two was the evidence of humility. This attitude of humility is found in unity. I'm sorry. The attitude of humility found in unity was not to be at the expense of the truth. So when he says then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly. That didn't mean just go along and agree uh, it, it, that you have to agree with everything, whether it's right or it's wrong. It, it, it did not meet at any expense, but meant the same thing. We should all agree to the same thing, but should always be the right thing, according to the body and the, the word of God. We should not in any effort to maintain unity, forego the truth, our agreement and unity must always adhere to the word of God. We must have a life intent on unified purpose, a single goal, which is the gospel. R. Kent Hughes in his book on Philippians wrote, the gospel must be in the center of our thinking and at every level of ministry. 
So let's break that down, that verse down. Loving one another. This love should be a mutual love because the source is the same spirit within it, each of us. Our love is centered in the spirits flowing through the vine to the branches. You remember we did a series on the fruit of the spirit. Remember that that fruit is a natural outcome of what is running from the branch, which is Jesus runs through, or uh, God, the vine into us. We are the vine, and the, the fruit of the Spirit should come out of us as a natural effect of his being in us. It's the same Spirit within each of us. So as we love one another, we should be loving with a mutual love, working together. The believers should come together in a common goal and purpose, working together harmoniously. Humility calls for refusing to be offended. When's the last time you refused to be offended? And seeing yourself as compared to the sacrifice of Christ, making it necessary to put disagreements aside and working together for his mission. Everything I'm talking about today is going to be counterintuitive to what you would want to do naturally. Humility is not something that we default to. Humility is not something that we do naturally. Humility, humility, again, we must continually compare ourselves to God to place ourselves where we should be. Because if we compare ourselves to something else that makes us look good, then we have a wrong perception of ourselves. So, can you refuse to be offended? Can you put disagreements aside because of your mutual unity in Christ? And the last, last one that he noted there in verse 2 was being united in one mind and purpose. Believers should be humble toward one another, mindful of their spiritual brotherhood and their ultimate subjection to Christ. So in living out our humility, we should see others as better than ourselves. That's not what we do naturally. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, isn't it? Ephesians 4.2 says, Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Humble, being humble, the word humble was not a popular word in Greek society. It meant to be weak. It meant to be groveling at someone's feet. It wasn't till later that it was made popular again in the gospel. And it presented a distinctively Christian virtue which opposes the arrogance of the heathen or the, those who are not Christians. So I'll tell you what, I learned this a long time ago. For, for a, a season I worked at Apple and I, I lived in Chester County and worked in Delaware and I had an hour's ride each way and I'd be driving, of course, as happens to all of us, we get cut off by someone. I would get pretty angry when that happened. Now, I didn't, it was a terrible road rage, but I was pretty unhappy that I got cut off. I'd have anger, I'd have frustration, sometimes maybe blow my horn, maybe more than once. We've all had that person riding our bumper where you can't even see their headlights behind you, right? Because of their displeasure with something you did. And one day I was driving in the car and Fran was in the car with me and somebody did that in front of me. And this is what my wise wife said to me. That, that could be me. Sometimes I do that. I maybe don't see the person I pull out. I'm not going as fast as they want to and they're on my tail. They're beeping their horn. They're doing it. And I immediately remember relative to how you look at it, I immediately said, oh, so that person in front of me could be Fran. She said, there could be people who are in a hurry because they're called to the hospital. We have that now, right? Called to the hospital because their loved one is, they, they got the call. You better get here soon. And so they're not thinking about you. They're thinking about where they need to be. So now when I have that happen, of course it still happens, I think maybe that would be Fran there and someone else is behind her and I would like them to treat her like I want to treat this person now. Do I, is, is, 
you know, 1 Peter 3.8 says it this way, finally, all of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender-hearted, and keep humble attitude. Really, my reaction would be saying, when I got angry, that I was more important than them. How dare you pull out in front of me? How dare you slow me down? I have somewhere I need to be. But if I stop and I look at it and I don't place myself as more important to them, it says, okay, I back back up. Maybe they've got somewhere they have to be. I'm not as important as they are. That's not normal. It's something you have to consciously think. But who are you comparing yourself to? Peter draws from this same well. He call, he's calling for disciples to be of one mind, tender-hearted, and humble. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep a humble attitude. All right, Paul goes on in verses 3 and 4. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourself. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. So Paul outlines then in number three the method of humility. We've looked at the basis for humility, the evidence of humility, and now we're looking what, does, what method do we use to be humble? The Christian attitude should reveal itself in humility. People should be able to recognize that we're followers of Jesus because of our humility. Let's break it down. He talked about don't be selfish. Let's look at selfishness, ver selflessness, selflessness versus selfishness. Are you always thinking about yourself or how something affects you? Like I was driving in the car. Rather than how the other person is feeling. Are you more concerned with how you will be seen or how you can help regardless of the perception? Are you selfless or are you selfish? Will you give of yourself or is it all about you? That is the question only you can answer. But can you change it if you're being selfish? Can you become selfless? Yes. It's who you compare yourself to. And compared to God, we are nothing. And when you see yourself in that way, you can only be humble. And, you, and if you look at others that way, you can only treat them well and be selfless, giving of yourself. It goes on. How about self-unimportance versus pride? As I said, is it all about you? You're always right. You know better than everybody else. Or do you see yourself in the light of Jesus, his humility, his sacrifice? Are you out for your own interests or are you out for others? Are you out for others' centeredness or for your own? Do you focus on your own needs or the needs of others? Do you have Christ-like love? Do you care more for others' needs than your own? He promises if you put others first, he will provide all you need. So who are you putting your trust in? Remember, trust was the basis for faith. Colossians 3.12 says this, Since God chose you to be holy, the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Romans says it. Paul says in Romans, because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think of your don't don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given you. He says Paul says it both in Philippians, Colossians, to the Romans, this obviously was an issue in all the churches. He had to say, your natural inclination is to think about yourself. Your natural inclination is to put yourself before others. And he's saying, if you're following Jesus Christ, what was his example that he gave? Let's continue in verses 5 through 8. 
You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in, dis in obedience to God and died a, a criminal's death on a cross. Let that sink in for a second. So when we think of humility, there is no greater example. Jesus is the epitome of humility. That's not what the Jewish people were expecting in a Messiah. They expected a king riding in on a horse with an army behind him to free them from Roman occupation. Jesus came and he was the epitome of humility. So number four is the attitude of humility. We just looked at the method. Now we're going to look at what attitude should you have when you're humble. We are to duplicate the same attitude as Jesus. How did he do that? Well, the first thing is he abdicated the throne. We've, that's happened in our lifetime in England. I forget the, the person of the royal family who did it, but they, they would rather be married divorced woman, <coughs> so they had to give up the throne. They abdicated the throne. They were out of the line to be king. He, he felt his relationship with this lady was more important than being king. Well, God, ab Jesus abdicated the throne. He was God. He, he is God, but he was with God at all times in Genesis, in the beginning. John, John 1, in the beginning, the word, there was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus is God. So he abdicated his authority, his, his throne, and he left that. He gave it up to come down here. He forfeited his equality with God. He was equal with God. He was God. He was part of the Trinity. But he said, <coughs> I'm going to, excuse me. <coughs> he said, I'm going to give that up. And I'm going to come down to save these people. He never gave up his deity. <coughs> That's what John speaks about in his whole gospel. His focus was on the deity of Christ, that he was God and man. And I've said this to you before, he had to be God and he had to be man. He had to be God to be holy and sinless. And he had to be man <coughs> so that his shed blood would be a sacrifice for all of us. So he was obedient even unto death. He obeyed the Father and came down here for us and he said, no, you don't have to go and get the punishment. That could be any one of us. He pulled us aside. Some have said that we're Barabbas, who was scheduled for that cross. And Jesus said, the people chose. But in essence, Barabbas was taken off that cross, and Jesus took it. So we're all equivalent to Barabbas. We're guilty, deserve death, but we were pardoned. And Jesus went up there and took that penalty for us. Second Corinthians 8 9 says this, you know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty he could make you rich. Now that doesn't mean that our bank accounts are going to be full when we accept the Lord. That rich doesn't mean that rich is in that relationship with the Father. That richness is the holiness that we will have when we are with him. That richness is what God sees when he looks down on us and he sees Jesus instead of us if we've accepted him. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. You know, we show this every time we reenact the foot washing in our communion. That is what he was doing at that time. He was coming to show that he should be served. Somebody said last night when I was releasing the people and I let the front rows go first, the gentleman in the middle said, shouldn't the last be first? I said, good point. Should have let the back row go first. Really? Because that's what Jesus is saying, right? He who raises himself will 
be made low. He who keeps himself low will be raised up. And we're going to get to that in a second. Even though he died a criminal's death on a cross, he rose again. And he sits at the right hand of the Father right now. And he makes intercession on our behalf. So what he did was then God showed the results of humility. Point five is the results of humility. Let's read verse 9. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So what are the results when we follow Jesus' example and humble ourselves? Well, James 4.9 says, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. Humble yourself, and you'll be lifted up in honor. Humbling yourself through repentance of sin. That's how you get to that. That's how you make yourself right with God. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. At the right time, that means his timing, not ours. But when he knows it's the time, and it may not be to end times, but he will lift us up in honor. At the right time, our humility will be rewarded, even if it's not until the judgment seat. And then Luke 14, 11, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Let your humility place others before yourself. Your sacrifice will be rewarded by being raised up when he appoints you to a high position. If you can decide now to say, I see others as more important than myself, I'm going to allow that person to walk in front of me. I'm going to allow that person to pull out in front of me. I'm going to allow that person to get the job raise before I, promotion before I do. I'm going to do that, and I'm going to humble myself. And if you do that because of your relationship with Christ, you will be rewarded. You will be lifted up. You will be honored. That's what it promises. But I'm going to revert back to what I started with. That isn't the reason you should do it. Remember, our motivation means everything. You should be humbling yourself because of who you are, who am I, as compared to the great I am. That is where it should start. That should be the foundation of it. But he promises that if you do that and you lower yourself and not be made low, he will raise you up. That's the promise. How you treat others today will affect how you're rewarded in the future by Christ. So let me ask you this question. What attitude does God see when he looks to you? When he looks at you, what attitude does God see? Does he see the attitude of Christ, the humility of Christ, that he gave up everything so that others would have? He abdicated the throne, he forfeited his equality with God, and he obeyed unto death for you. For you. He says, you're no longer guilty. You're pardoned. I'm going to take the penalty instead. Should we not have that attitude? Should we not lower ourselves? Just in the recognition of what he did for us? Remember, it's what you compare something to is how you perceive it. What do you compare yourself to? As you look at your level of humility, who are you measuring yourself against? Are you patterning, patterning yourself after the attitude of Christ who gave up all he had in order to give us what we could never have without him? Can you see others in the same way, setting yourself aside for someone else? Jesus Christ is the epitome of humility, the perfect example. Let's change our attitudes to match his. I always put at the end of the, the handout there uh, the, the gospel invitation there, and you'll notice that the four words missing in the four verses there are all the same. 
It's God. It's our sins that have cut us off from him. We've all fallen short of his glorious standard. But he has given us a free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And if you speak with your mouth and you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Let's all leave today and let's all have the attitude of Christ and see others like Jesus saw. He saw himself less important than you, but he was God of the universe. Let's pray. Lord, how could we ever compare ourselves to you? Who am I that's compared to you? The answer to that is a cherished child of God. That's how you see us. As your cherished children. Help us, Lord, to live up to that in the humility, to put others before ourselves, to live our lives as though others are more important because we know who we are as compared to you. And in that humility, we also see that we are not more important than anyone else, that you died for everyone. And for those who choose to believe and choose to claim that great gift that you gave the gift of mercy, the gift of salvation, that we can be with you and be called your children, be joint heirs with Christ. So Lord, I thank you for everyone in here and for the message they heard today. And I just ask, Lord, that each one would hear what they needed and was meant for them to hear. Help all of us to apply it to our lives, Lord, as we see ourselves against others. And as we start to change, our behavior, and put others before ourselves, that that will bring glory to you as others recognize we're doing that because we are followers of, of God and followers of Christ. So Lord, be with each of us through whatever the weather is calling for. Be with those of us who are mourning lost ones, but they aren't those that aren't lost but are with you, Lord. We give praise and we give thanks. We give you all the honor, we give you all the love, in Jesus' name, amen.